Hello, thank you all of you for tuning in today. My name is Cecilia Zumbajo. I'm a PhD student and uh, you can follow me on social media where I post a lot about how amazing plants and seeds are. In fact, today I'm going to talk to you about the evolution of a crucial part of the seed, which is the seed code. It is not a secret that the seed is one of the most important evolutionary novelties in land plant evolution, as it has allowed them to colonize very different environments. Seed plants are the most abundant plant lineage on earth. Here on the right, we have an example of a seed. And if we make a longitudinal section through that seed, we would see something like this with the three main tissues that form the seed. The protective layer, uh, which is the seed coat, the embryo and the nutritive tissue, which is going to nourish that embryo. But the seed is just a mature stage of the ovule. When the ovule gets fertilized, it becomes the seed. If we make a longitudinal section through that ovule, we would see something like this, with the megasporangium or nucellus covered by the integument. The integument will undergo a series of ontogenetic transformations, becoming the seed coat. The ovule is defined as a megasporangium covered by the integument. So today I'm going to take you through a very quick uh, trip on the evolution of land plants and I'm going to highlight those innovations that took place related with reproductive structures. We're going to start in the Devonian because uh, many of those evolutionary novelties took place during the Devonian explosion. Here we already have uh, vascular plants and one of the most conspicuous innovations was the appearance of heterospory. So instead of having homosporous sporangia, sporangia are the sacs containing the spores producing bisexual gametes. Now we have mi micro and mega spores producing male and female gametes respectively. There is also endosporic develop development at this point. Another key lineage within lycophytes that was actually very successful during the Carboniferous were uh, Lepidor and Grelis. These are very different to all the lycophytes that we know nowadays. They were a tree, very tall trees. And they also evolved a structure resembling a seed. So it's a functionally convergent seed like a structure. We find that in Lepidocarpon, where we see this megasporangium covered by integument like structures, there is also food storage tissue and an opening resembling a micropile. The difference is that this megasporangium dehisces releasing the archegonia on the surface, allowing the easy access for the flagellated sperm. So now we have a dehiscent megasporangium. Heterospory actually appeared and evolved multiple times during the evolution of vascular plants, and we see it nowadays in lycophytes and aquatic ferns, but it was finally retained by progymnosperms and seed plants, which together form the lignophytes. All progymnosperms are extinct, but uh, one of the main representatives or most well-known fossils is archaeosperma, where we see this megasporangia covered by integumentary lobes, partially fused. Within progymnosperms, we also see all different degrees of fusion of those integumentary lobes, forming what we know now as a pre ovule Later on, during the Permian, three main lineages of gymnosperms evolved, and these all have extant representatives like ginkgo, cycads, and coniferms. So this was the first time that an actual integument covering the megasporangium evolved. And within gymnosperms, the micropile, the opening that allows the pollen to enter, produces a pollination drop to catch that pollen. And this wouldn't be possible without the fusion of those integumentary lobes. There are also some uh, fossil lineages that have been very difficult to classify, for example, Chitonia, but they provide evidence for the subsequent evolution of Nitalis and Angiosperms during the Cretaceous. Now, all of these lineages have ovules and seed, but there is still a lot of morphological diversity. For example, most gymnosperms have only one integument and they have orthotropous orientation with the micropile located opposite to the stalk. Whereas most angiosperms have two integuments and an atropous orientation as the result of asymmetric growth of the uh, outer integument. So to better understand the development and the genetics behind ovule development, the model species Arabidopsis saliana has been quite well studied. 
Here we have an SEM photograph of the ovules, which after fertilization will become the seed. There are many genes involved in ovule development and they have been classified into three main categories according to the time and the function they have. In integument initiation are genes like integumenta, BEL1, and inner no outer. Later on in establishing integument identity, there are some genes like aberrant testa shape, canary one and two, class three HT seeds, and unicorn. These genes establish mostly the planar identity of the integuments. Then the integuments have to elongate in order to cover that nucellus. And some of the genes involved in this process are short integuments one and superman. So Arabidopsis evolved six million years ago. What has happened with those genes and what are these genes doing in other ovule morphologies that diversified around 300 million years ago? To answer this question, we focus our research in the genes that are involved in integument initiation and identity. Why integument? Because it is the structure that actually makes an ovule an ovule. We also work with a gymnosperms because this is the first extent a lineage where ovules evolved. Here on the left, we have the evolutionary hypothesis for gymnosperms, and there is a still there is a lot of morphological diversity for the ovules and seeds within gymnosperms. In ginkgo, for example, there is only one integument, but this integument becomes fleshy. In needle, there are two envelopes in addition to the integument, and the outer envelope becomes fleshy. In ephedra, there are bracts surrounding the seed, and in some taxa, those bracts become fleshy, in others, they don't. In taxus, there is an extract structure uh, known as, an, uh, as the aril, and this becomes fleshy and also surrounds the entire seed. Today, we're going to focus on ginkgo. Ginkgo has a simple ovule morphology, and we were able to collect many different stages during ovule development that we also described anatomically, starting by integument initiation, going through integument elongation so that the integument overtops the nucellus. And as the ovule grows, we're able to see the three different regions or zones that form the integument in ginkgo. Here uh, is a longitudinal section of a pollen cone, which we see also here on the right. So to understand how these uh, genes have evolved across seed plants, we perform expansiotemporal expression analysis in the homologs of these six different genes in ginkgo. And we started with Wuschel. Wuschel in Arabidopsis is expressed in the nucellus, but it acts in integument initiation. In ginkgo, we found that a wood shell is expressed in the nucellus and also in the integuments throughout ovule development. We see expression also in the pollen grains and in the leaf. All these other genes are expressed in integument in integuments in Arabidopsis, but in ginkgo, we didn't see expression in the integuments. We saw expression in the abscission zone of the ovule, as well as in the megaspore molar cell. And some of these genes are also expressed in the pollen grains and in the leaves. So we didn't see expression in the integuments for these genes. So up until this point, we still don't know which genes are involved in integument initiation, in integument development in general in gymnosperms. So to further answer this question, we performed transcriptome analysis and we dissected and sequenced the different uh, plant organs in ginkgo. We sequenced the young ovule to identify genes that are expressed since early in ovule development. Then we dissected the mature ovule and we sequenced the integument separate from the megagametophyte and the collar to identify genes that are specific to each of these organs. We also sequenced the leaf and the pollen cone to have as reference. We performed differential expression analysis and we identified 2,137 differential expressed genes. From those, 134 were transcription factors. So in this cluster maps, I'm showing you in blue, upregulated genes, and in yellow, downregulated genes. We perform all the comparisons against integument because that's our interest. 
and we focus our attention on those genes that are upregulated in the integument, but also those that are downregulated in the integument compared to all the other tissues to have a better assessment of the ovule developmental network in gymnosperms. So we have three major conclusions that we have been able to achieve due to the combination of paleontology, morphoanatomy, developmental biology, and bioinformatics. The first one is that the origin of the integument in seed plants may have been the result of co-option of those genes that are involved in sporangia development, or they are the result of a sterilization of sporangia. And these two hypotheses are actually not mutually exclusive, but these must have happened much earlier in, an evolu in evolutionary time, as it has been shown that these genes are function in sporangia development in mosses, lycophytes, and ferns. The second conclusion is that the ovule genetic network is not conserved across seed plants, as we see major differences between gymnosperms and angiosperms. And third, we uh, have done what we consider major breakthroughs in the identification of new candidate genes for integument development in gymnosperms, like members of the AP2ARF and Fantastic Four protein families. Now, uh, I would like to thank all our funders, my home institutions, and to BSA for all the support that I have received during the last couple of years. And as an international student, I really appreciate all the inclusion, support, and openness of this society. And I'm very thankful for that. 